Kidney tumor ablation. Um, I, as many of you may know, I'm very passionate about it, and uh, it's been a lot big part of my career. So now, after 22 years of doing ablation, my first one was in 2000. Um, I'm here to hopefully educate you on how uh, the appropriate patients for ablation. So on that note, just a quick uh, brief, uh, quick introduction. We all know this by now, I hope. Um, I'm going to focus on the two ablation technologies in the guidelines. They're the only ones that are endorsed is cryoablation and radiofrequency ablation. Uh, we could, later tonight, if we have time, we can talk about microwave or IRE as alternatives. But the only ones that are approved and are, can be coded are cryo and RF. So cryo, we all know, you have to achieve a negative 20 degrees um, for direct cellular injury. And radio frequency is uh, a little bit hard to imagine in your head, but essentially it's a glorified Bovi machine. Um, we have a grounding pad and we're d uh, alternating current just like the Bovi. The only difference is the current is being uh, modulated by the radio frequency by the machine so that it doesn't char. Uh, and you want to desiccate the tumor as opposed to freeze it. So you're either going to cook it or you're going to freeze it in terms of uh, to the technologies available for ablation. The other thing to make very clear that we all understand, a complete treatment in, in kidney ablation is non-enhancing tissue on a CT or an MRI that would correspond to the location and the configuration of the previously enhancing tumor. Okay, so it's all radiographic, uh, and this would thereby con translate into non-perfused equals non-viable. That has been now established in the literature after many debates for the first decade of my career in doing ablations about is non-perfused on CT or MRI reliable? The answer is absolutely reliable. Can there be micro recurrences? Of course, we'll, we can always talk about that, but this is the definition of success. We usually want to see the ablation zone be larger than the original tumor, and then you know uh, you have covered it all, per se. What does an ablation look like? This is a radio frequency ablation, and I show this uh, in terms of the, what, it, what an RFA looks like. In cryoablation, the lesions, if those of you have seen any other, anybody do these, or your patients, the lesion usually uh, shrinks and goes away. It really uh, gets uh, reabsorbed. Radio frequency doesn't do that. So if you see a tumor like this, uh, and uh, 12 months later, I'll have someone come back and radiologists say, oh, uh, you know, left kidney angiomyolipoma. That's not an angiomyolipoma. That's an, it's a contracted wedge defect with some fat infiltration that replaces the tumor that was ablated. So RFA, it's normal to have this picture. And when you see a patient that's had this, oh no, this is nothing to worry about. This is a successful ablation. Uh, cryo, you might see a complete defect completely replaced by fat. RF, you always have a residual tumor. So I think that's a good take home point. If you don't, uh, if you have radiologists that may do one or the other or both. So in 2021, now this slide obviously is a few months old, but guidelines are clear. In 2022, all patients that are tumors less than three centimeters are candidates for an ablation. And this has to be part of your informed consent when you, and shared decision making. If you're not sharing this with your patient, you are not ma maintaining standard of care. It was for, for 15 years, not the case, but now it is. Now, clearly a tumor is adjacent to the hilum. Uh, one of uh, Mark's cases that you just saw that is seven centimeters, no, those are not candidates. But less than three centimeters, you have to discuss this as an option. Uh, you don't want to burn the ureter, you don't want to freeze the bowel, but if it's, in a, if it's in a location that it's approachable, it has to be discussed. And even over three centimeters, there is literature we're not going to have time to go cover that we do treat. I treat four and five centimeter tumors that may not be candidates for surgery uh, because of age or comorbidity. But so over three, it's okay to do surgery. Or, and, and not even discuss an ablation per se. But under three, you have to discuss ablation as an option with our patients. So we don't have a lot of time. I'm gonna go over efficacy, functional advantages of ablation, cost, and then the latest indications. So guidelines uh, in 17 um, uh, were uh, updated and um, looked at, uh, at oncologic efficacy. And absolutely, there is a, a, a measurable 
even in under three centimeter tumors, this is what we're talking about, a slightly higher chance of having an incomplete treatment compared to partial nephrectomy. That is residual tumor that may recur. That's a function of trying to be too precise. So I'm trying to kill a two and a half centimeter tumor. I do an ablation that's 2.6. And sometimes with heat sink, I'm not getting the entire tumor. If I made a 3.5 centimeter ablation, I would have 100% success. So it's a technical error that we could have some local recurrence. But the beauty of, a partial, of, a, of a, an ablation, as opposed to the not beauty of a redo partial nephrectomy, is that you can redo a, an ablation percutaneously, outpatient, still less morbid two times than it is one time to have a robotic partial nephrectomy. And if I can do a second ablation because I was super precise the first time, my oncologic efficacy is equivalent to partial nephrectomy. So you can, I don't think it's appropriate to counsel your patients, oh, we're not gonna do an ablation because those don't, are not as good as surgery. Yes, sometimes on the first try, but this is an outpatient procedure where you're gonna go home with no recovery. And if it don't get it all, I can always do it again. As opposed to surgery, if I don't get it all, you don't wanna go back again, then you're sending them to Mark to, to try to clean up, right? So a repeat ablation is a risk. It's not a downside in terms of oncologic efficacy for our patients when they go home the same day. So there are lots of literature to support the oncologic efficacy of, of surgery versus ablation, not just in the guidelines, but in the literature. So this is the abstract from this paper. Uh, clearly showing when you looked at the SEER database, less than four centimeters, we're looking at, you know, obviously several thousand patients and the, the predicted disease specific survival at five years with partial nephrectomy, 98%, with ablation, 97%, to my point. With appropriately selected patients, no difference between surgery and ablation. <clears throat> what about renal functional outcomes? So that, that's all I'm gonna say about efficacy, oncologic efficacy under three centimeters. So what about uh, uh, um, renal function? first looked at by our group, you know, 13, 14 years ago. And when you looked at partial nephrectomy versus radiofrequency ablation, the risk of a GFR insult to your kidney, a CKD, going from good function to CKD3, uh, there was a significant uh, advantage to ablation. And it remains so today that uh, uh, an ablation cryo ORF preserves renal function better than partial nephrectomy. And we can talk about, I have a couple of comments about renorophy uh, regarding to Mark's, Mark's presentation, and I believe it has to all do with the renorophy and the loss of renal function when we do a partial nephrectomy compared to there is no renorophy. We're just ablating some tissue. We're not compromising the rest of the kidney with an ablation, so we should get better kidney function, and we do. This is a, a study, as you can tell by the title, looking at parenchymal volume preservation, comparing partial cryo and RF using 3D measurements. Saul Waldo, some uh, well-known, respected authors here, Jamie Landman, leader in cryoablation, James McKiernan, we all know who he is. And looking at this busy slide, but you can see that when you look at the first line, change in non-parenchymal, non-malignant renal volume uh, measured on the, CD, on the CT scan and looked at function in terms of percent GFR, uh, et cetera. But you can see thermal ablation in the first common col column versus partial nephrectomy. The change in parenchymal volume in thermal ablation was 8%. That, that in partial nephrectomy is twice as much loss of kidney function, 16%. These were matched patients, all T1As. And then if you look at percent loss of renal function, again, an advantage. And so for ablation versus partial, four versus 13%. And this is actually why when I see a patient with a solitary kidney, my first thought is I'm always gonna look to see if I can do a, an ablation and not a partial nephrectomy in a tumor because I know I can preserve better function with an ablation than I can preserve with a partial nephrectomy. So my two go to, go -to on on patients with solitary kidneys is this because of this data. The kidneys do better. What about cost? Well, it's a no-brainer. Of course, robotic and laparoscopic, this is laparoscopic, but of course, robotic, which is what we all do now, and I've transitioned to robotic as well, is literally gonna be twice as much as a percutaneous ablation. 
And these are real cost data. This is 2005, so uh, we haven't updated it. This is the first paper ever showing uh, the obviousness of a, of a cost advantage, and there have been subsequent papers showing the same thing. So percutaneous ablation was almost uh, just around 60% of a laparoscopic. You know with the robotic, it's going to be 50%. So I can do two percutaneous ablations for the cost of one robotic partial nephrectomy without the pain, without the bleeding, without the hospital recovery. So it is a cost advantageous. It's not cost advantageous for our own pocket, though. For those of you who were here yesterday afternoon, you heard me say how the reimbursement has gone to hell for percutaneous ablation. But that's not the patient's fault. And, I'm, uh, and so, but we don't get paid well for percutaneous ablation uh, compared to what we'd get for partial. And we can, again, talk about that uh, if you want to revisit that tonight. So the, fo the real focus I wanted to uh, go through now is uh, focus on this, and that is, okay, it's established. Can we do, can we, can I give you some more information on what is the ideal situation for a, per for a perc ablation? Uh, so first in 2012, our group uh, started to look at this and, and tumor size. And so this is with radiofrequency ablation, long-term disease-free uh, survival. And we looked at 160 tumors retrospective, all with at least three-year disease-free uh, 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 follow-up, three-year follow-up. And we looked at the success rates. Less than two and a half centimeters, we were excellent. Two, to th two and a half to three, not so good, but we salvaged to 96% with the second ablation. And over three centimeters, we never did that great. I know at first to admit that. So this is the first paper that then ended up I, where the guidelines are based on the three centimeter rule. So it's interesting. We talk about T1A tumors, which is up to four centimeters. I actually personally believe the T1A, in terms of treatment guidelines, should be revised to T1A should be three centimeters or less because we all even know that the biology of a three and a half centimeter tumor is really different than a two and a half centimeter tumor, and it makes a difference in how you treat them. So the three centimeter rule is, uh, when I hear people talk about T1A and ablation, it always gives me pains because a 3.9 is not the same as a 2.5 when it comes to ablation. And this doesn't matter for cry, it matters same for cryo. So, and that's why the guidelines make no, no difference, no, no, uh, identify no difference uh, or, uh, in terms of recommendation. Laparoscopic cryoablation for renal masses, the U U.S., the uh, Wash U experience, the largest and longest in the world because they were doing lap cryos back in the you know, 1990s. Multivariate analysis in terms of risk of recurrence, and the only thing that stood out was tumor size, 2.5 centimeters. Then UCSD, another paper with University of Tennessee, looking at cryo. 150 patients, similar to our study, T1A, four years follow-up, overall 88%, but the cutoff was three centimeters. Again, so this is where the guidelines say the three centimeters, and that's where I was emphasizing earlier. So big difference in success between three over three and less than three centimeters. So <clears throat> that's where the 2017 guideline statement came out. Uh, and it now is followed up in the, in, in the update. But the panel felt that thermal ablation should be reserved for smaller tumors less than three centimeters in size unless other comorbidities or factors may dictate trying to push the envelope. And so I do push the envelope, as I'll show you here in a second, in a few patients. But that's where the guideline indications came from. The other thing that's important, none of the guidelines make any specific reference to age and comorbidities as an, as an indication. It is effective for any one of us in the audience or younger. All right? There is no, age doesn't matter in the success of an ablation. Freezing or heating doesn't care. You know, we all can get frostbite tonight, today, outside in the mountain. So it doesn't matter how old you are. So we are biased to want to do a partial, but that's not fair to our patients. So this is, again, one of the first papers was published by our, our group, but I'll show you. The age didn't matter. So 58 tumors, 2.2 centimeters, ideal to patients, right? Followed up for five years. The five-year and 10 years disease-free survival, that is no tumor, 94%. Uh, and the overall survival, by the way, the overall survival of 10 years was only 91%. These are, these are patients 57 years old. That's me. It's kind of sorry, scary that... 
8% of us may not be here in, in 10 years, right? So you can't assume that everybody young is gonna live forever anyway. And when you look at a 55 year old man, my age has a five year overall survival of 95% and a 10 year survival of 90%, which is exactly what we showed. So ablation never compromised their outcomes, okay? So ablation is okay for any age. And they're durable, 10 year outcomes. We see it always plateau after five or so. So we see disease-free survivals after three centimeters appropriately selected tumors. We see outcomes that are uh, acceptable over the long term. So, um, and, and we see that the same, sorry, same thing for cryoablation. I don't have a slide on cryo, this is RF. This I think is one of the more exciting uh, things in terms of tailoring your ablation uh, recommendations. Um, RCC subtype, does it influence thermal ablation? And the gut feeling was that it might, and in fact, it does. So this is uh, radio frequency, I'll show you cryo uh, in a second, but when you look at RCC subtypes, that is clear cell versus papillary, the most common two, and you look at ablation success, they separate. And clear cell success being that def definition of no viable tumor and long-term here over five-year follow-up, papillary is almost 100% successful and clear cell doesn't. There is a de decline in clear cell. Why? Because this is a thermal ablation of a hypervascular tumor, RC uh, clear cell, right? So there's gonna be heat sinks and there could be micro heat sinks within the tumor where it's really hypervascular flow and we might have residual tumor that we don't even know about and, and it may recur several years later and have to be repeated. But with papillary being a hypovascular tumor, they do amazingly well. And there is no heat sink and so they freeze or, or cook uh, with very high success. And in fact, the UCSD Tennessee data that I just uh, showed you earlier by size also looked at it by grade and tumor type. And as you can see here, not only did size matter, which I just told you, but high grade, meaning more hypervascular, we know that, and that's almost always gonna be clear cell in this patient population, which is just T1A. And then if you look at it, clear cell 88% versus 97% of four years for papillary. So uh, again, tumor type matters. So this comes to the concept that we talked about, you know, biopsy, not biopsy, but oh, wait a minute. If I'm considering an ablation, I might want to biopsy this patient, right? If, he's got, if he or she has a high-grade clear cell carcinoma on biopsy, which is not that common, I really might actually show them this data and say we should just do a partial. But if I know it's an African-American patient with a hypo-enhancing tumor, I, I know it's a papillary. If I want to prove it, I can biopsy it. It's a papillary. I know ablation is going to work. Oh, there's no way I'm going to do a partial nephrectomy and offer that patient that, that, that operation if I know it's going to be a papillary carcinoma because I can't do better than 97, 98%. Um, Mayo Clinic, same thing, JVIR, published a couple of years ago, 170 patients, ideal 2.9 centimeters, five-year disease-free survival, 90%. I just try to remember these numbers, 90 for clear cell, 100% for papillary. So it does matter what type of tumor you're going to treat. And again, I hope you take that home in terms of how you advise your patients uh, regarding the, the role of ablation. What about cryo versus RF? That issue has been settled uh, over a decade ago. So please don't ask any questions about which one is better. There is no which one's better. It's just whichever one is cheaper or whichever one you have in the closet uh, at, at home. And that's the one you should use. The data is very clear in multiple papers, this is just uh, an abstract for several years ago now, showing that in a pooled analysis, uh, with there was no difference between cryo and RF, again, the 90%, because these were almost all clear cell carcinomas. Uh, so there was no statistical difference in efficacy between cryo and RF. The Mayo Clinic uh, published the largest experience in the appropriately selected tumor, that is masses less than three centimeters. They looked at local control, and complications, so you can't, you, you can't argue one is better than the other in this either. So for almost uh, 400 and some uh, tumors, again, concluding uh, that there is no difference in efficacy or complications when you do appropriately selected tumors with radiofrequency or cryoablation. So the guidelines endorse that, that these are the appropriate options and there was no one preference versus the other. 
So we don't have time about this, uh, microwave and IRE. So to conclude, in two seconds, reliable data, nephron sparing, less expensive, reduces the risk. Thank you very much.